and we are back on the record. Uh, Madam Clerk, if you would read the next agenda item, please. Yes, number four, 2017-064, appropriations $338,290.86. The police superior offices, fire alarm union, department head, and manage line salary increases. Thank you. Councilor Thank you, Madam President. This was a matter we took up at the last budget season, and the, the funding of the money sat in the reserve for appropriation um, account. Well, Madam Moderator has, in, in more context, should like to elaborate on, but that's essentially the, um, the back, backdrop there. Madam Moderator. Um, currently, um, at the time of last year's budget, there was money that was um, appropriated and um, put into the reserve. Um, that reserve, as, as the unions have settled, we have taken, uh, the council has taken a vote to move the money out of the reserve into the lines of those particular unions that had settled. Um, currently, the police offices, the superior offices have settled. Um, we are also, we have the fire alarm union and department head raises along with management lines at this time. Thank you, Madam Auditor. I move with that. Council I move approval. Motion to approve by Council Crawl, seconded by Council Javon on the motion. Council Collins. If I may, through you to the mayor's representative, uh, where does this leave us with outstanding? Uh, is there anyone outstanding? There is. Through you, Madam President, the uh, patrol officers union uh, remains uh, on. Resolved uh, at this point, we came forward uh, with the appropriation for everything else because uh, patrol officers are uh, going to arbitration and that will be uh, outside of the city's control at this point. So, we thought that that was an appropriate time uh, to bring in the remainder of the appropriate uh, reserve appropriations. What's the timeline on that process? It's, uh, it's a state run process, council. Um, it, it could be months. Uh, I don't have an exact uh, timeline on that. And I suppose. At some other point, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about perhaps the budgeting process about funding potential monies. Yeah, through. I mean, I'm, I'm thinking in Boston's arbitration didn't go so well with the fire department. Yeah. A couple of years Madam ago. President, through you. Unexpected. It, it, it certainly could be, and that's the. the um, you know, that's the balance that when you take an uh, initiative arbitration, but arbitrations are. Uh, mutually binding. Uh, they involve both parties. Um, the city has been, I don't want to get into too many details, but we have been uh, relatively successful. And I want to point out that there's not um, much animus in terms of the negotiations here. There's not a lot of ill will. Um, the, the two sides uh, just came to a conclusion that an arbitrator would be best uh, served to, to handle this issue. Uh, all the unions that have agreed to settlements in the city uh, have agreed to the same uh, wage increases, uh, and that is essentially what is on the table with the police officers. Um, and again, we certainly don't want to um, infringe on their right to, to seek an arbitrator to, to assist in the process, but um, we feel uh, fairly confident in, in, in our position uh, through the work of the Human Resources Department. Um, so we'll, we've been through this process before, uh, we'll be through it again uh, with other uh, issues, um, and it's something that we feel pretty comfortable with. Okay, yeah, I mean, I certainly think that people's living in the human leadership has to do with uh, it's best for their members uh, to obtain to arbitration if that's what they need. It is necessary, I have no problem with that. I just want to make sure that we know what our potential liability is down the road, given what we've seen happen in the past with other municipalities where it is one very large, cumbersome, difficult check to swallow that has to be paid out retroactively. Sure, Council, thank you again, Madam President. Just quickly, I, I think that there are some larger issues at play in the city of Boston uh, than we have here in the city of Quincy. Essentially, uh, our issues are this contract, uh, this contract only. Uh, I could be wrong, but my, my sense is that yeah. the city of Boston was dealing with some long term, fairly complicated issues uh, over the course of a very long period of time. Um, this is one contract, I think this went back perhaps years. Okay. Um, in, in Boston. So I think that might be a little bit of a difference. Again, I don't want to speak out of school. I don't know all of that's in that case, but I think that we might be a little bit different. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? 
All right, so there's a motion to approve, seconded by Councilor Fauna. Madam Clerk, if you would call the roll. Councilor <coughs> Payne. Councilor Kroll. Yes. Councilor Fauna. Yes. Councilor Finn. Yes. Councilor Harris. Yes. Councilor LaFarge. Yes. Councilor Leanne. Yes. Councilor Kamuji. Yes. President Hughes. Yes. Eight members. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. Next item on the agenda is 2017-065, appropriation to $68,170 from Hotel Motel Cast for 2017 tours and appropriation. Councilor Crow. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, we make a motion to refer this to Camino. Mr. Walker, I have on that. I know we'll take up the committee. All right, so there's a motion to uh, refer to finance by Council for All, seconded. No. no, okay, all those in favor? Aye. Great, the ayes have it. Thank you, Council Harris. Um, next item, so that would be referred to add to finance. Next item on the agenda is number six, 2017 066 PIP. $1,650 for various donors for the new program. All right. Thank you. Councilor Paul. Thank you. Um, to make more than we accept the gift and we call we could decide to make sure that the donors are recognized for the letter of that. All right. Sir. A motion to accept by Councilor Paul, second by Councilor Finn, and the motion on the call. Councilor King. Yes. Councilor Paul. Yes. Councilor Bonner. Yes. Councilor Finn. Yes. Councilor Harris. Yes. Councilor LaFarge. Yes. Councilor Leanne. Yes. Councilor Pelmerjee. Yes. President Hughes. Yes. Nine members. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, again, this is a resolution that, in many respects, emerges itself from the people, from the citizenry. This is actually a resolution that was put together with the Quincy Climate Action Network. Uh, and again, what they've been doing is they've actually been meeting with the councillors at large. I do believe they plan to meet with all the councillors, but this specific resolution that they have put together seemed to me to be um, a perfect uh, thing that could easily be forward as a resolution because it looks at the feasibility specifically of the utilization of electric uh, vehicles. And if we could, with the uh, unanimous consent of the body, perhaps we have with us here this evening, we have David Wright from the Quincy Climate Action Network. We also have with us as well uh, former Ward 3 City Councilor Larry Cresham, uh, who is today the Executive Director of the Mass Energy Consumers Alliance. And I thought if we could have a moment, perhaps they could come forward and talk a little bit about this resolution, why they put it forward, and why they think it's critically important. All right. So if there is no objection, all right. Very well. We welcome the uh, members from the uh, Kinsey Climate Action Committee to the podium. As the board chair of Quincy Climate Action Network, for a volunteer group that's working to increase the use of clean energy and energy efficiency uh, uh, in, in our city as a way of mitigating climate change. It's January, and our first membership meeting of the year, we experienced something unexpected. Lots of new faces in the room, and most of the people who dropped in that night ended up joining. In the second row tonight. Um, this is great for us, of course, but I started to wonder why the surge of interest. I think the answer is pretty clear. People have decided that with the federal government, we retreat from the 
battle against climate change. We have to do more locally. The resolution that's being introduced tonight deals with one of the many things we can do, and TKM wants to thank Councilors Finn, Leon, and Mona for sponsoring it. Recently, QCAN has devoted some time to learning about electric vehicles, also known as EVs, and here's what we've discovered. First, if the city began using EVs, it would help us meet our obligations under the Green Communities Act. As a green community, the city has been getting a lot of grant money from the state, a quarter of a million dollars in some years, for projects that increase our energy efficiency. In return, we committed to reduce our energy use by 20% in the course of five years. I think the five years ran out last summer, and even when the only street streetlights go in and out, I think this summer, uh, we're still going to be under 20% by, by GPS calculations. Again, members have also been told that gas, gasoline use by the city vehicle by city vehicles has actually increased in the last year or two. So the city fleet seems like low hanging fruit if we're looking to squeeze more efficiency out of city operations. Second thing we learned is that getting EVs will more than pay for itself, given the generous state and federal incentives, plus the savings on fuel and maintenance. The state also provides grants of up to $10,000 for cities and towns to install electric vehicle charging stations. From the numbers, and you'll find out that even if we just jumped our current fleet and left it to rust in the parking lot, we still come out ahead by reason of EVs. Because of the incentives, Weymouth is paying $500 a year to lease EVs, the Bedford is paying between $600 and $960 a year for theirs. And EVs get the equivalent of 100 miles per gallon plus and require almost no maintenance. One thing I should mention here, uh, just as a caution, is that this is something I just found out uh, two hours ago in a, an email from Larry, which is that the uh, state uh, pool of money uh, for, for, uh, uh, for the uh, EV incentives uh, for municipalities is temporarily run, run dry, but that uh, in time, uh, more money is going to be added. So that, uh, this is something uh, that the city can, can explore uh, um, without wasting uh, our time. Third point is that EVs will help reduce the pollutants in the air breathe by Quincy residents. As our friends in Fraps have been pointing out, air quality is a problem here, especially in the warm part of the year because of vehicle traffic industry and heat islands. Fourthly, EVs, by reducing greenhouse gas emissions, will help so slow climate change and thus sea level rise, which is already eating away at our coastline and flooding people's houses, resulting in significant economic loss to Quincy families. EVs and plug-in hybrids are the only type of vehicles going to produce less greenhouse gases as they age. That's because electric power is becoming greener year by year as more and more renewable power comes online. As green farms have built off our coast in the next few years, this trend will only accelerate. Finally, I want to point out that getting EVs is a leap into the great unknowns. Many municipalities already use them, including our neighbor, the neighbors in Weymouth and Braintree. Um, the Bedford has a couple of dozen of these EVs in their fleet. And according to their energy manager, whom, whom I spoke to on the phone last fall, they're very popular among the city staffers. To sum up, we at QGAN think this resolution is a no brainer. We think the mayor and his people will agree when they get a chance to look at the facts. We urge all city councilors to vote for it. And uh, Larry Creature is going to follow me knows a lot more uh, about the topic than I do, so uh, I probably want to reserve your questions for, uh, for him. Thank you, uh, Council President and uh, members of the council. Uh, Larry Creation, I live in 166 on Lab. Um, if I had known that you don't wear a necktie anymore, I still wouldn't be so <laughs> um, 
I'm here uh, in support of the resolution that was drafted by the uh, <laughs> friends at the uh, Climate Action Network, and I want to thank the councilors for sponsoring the resolution. Um, about five years ago, I worked with Mr. Walker to uh, help the city achieve green community investigation, <laughs> and we wrote the energy use reduction plan for the city. So we knew it was going to be hard to reduce energy consumption by the amount that we need to. Uh, at the time, we looked at all the different options that were available. Uh, buying, and included among that was buying more uh, fuel efficient gas powered vehicles. At the time, there were electric cars, uh, but not really of the quality uh, or the cost that you would consider to put into a city's plan. Uh, things have changed dramatically in the last five years. Electric vehicles are not of the future, they are ready for today. I've had one since 2015. I grew up here in a Chevrolet Volt that I plug in every night at home. Uh, and in the, that's a 2015 car. In two years, uh, the Volt has been upgraded. It's a much better car uh, than the one I have, which I love. Uh, now you can have a, a Nissan Leaf. It's all electric. It's over 100 miles per charge. You can get a Chevrolet Volt. It gets 238 miles per charge. Uh, these are cars that are affordable for the middle class. Uh, Tesla which typically has been selling cars at um, about $100,000, coming up with a car of about $40,000 in a few months. Um, so things have changed dramatically, basically because uh, the cost of uh, the lithium-ion batteries has absolutely plummeted in the last few years, and it's expected to continue to do that. And so every forward-looking jurisdiction in the world, um, countries, states, uh, cities and towns that have climate goals are looking to electric cars, uh, probably almost at the top of the list now. Uh, saving energy uh, is, is, uh, makes perfect sense. Buying more renewable energy, whether it's wind, solar, or hydro, makes sense. Uh, but what's sort of uh, left to the front now is uh, shifting the, uh, cars from gasoline to electricity for the reasons David said, which is that our grid's getting cleaner. And uh, so fun fact is a uh, Chevrolet uh, um, Toyota Prius, which is everyone considers to be a green car, uh, right now it produces two and a half times more carbon dioxide than a Chevrolet Volt running on electricity. Um, and that's going to change over, as time goes by, the Volt will have the advantage because, as David said, we keep adding renewable energy to the grid and making it cleaner. And so really there is no way for a city to achieve its climate goals without shifting uh, as many cars as possible. Massachusetts, uh, under Governor Baker, has a goal of having 300,000 electric cars in the state Right now, we have about 10,000. We, we have to increase that by 30 times by 2025. So a lot of work has to be done. And so a simple place to start is with the resolution that you have, which is saying that you're going to look at the city's fleet. Uh, if you're generally thinking about passenger vehicles, I suppose that um, you would uh, buy as an electric car, you could plug in. But you watch. Um, nowadays, there are, uh, there are vans being uh, retrofitted. There are trucks being retrofitted. Uh, Tesla's working on uh, electric semi. Um, there are huge passenger ferries that are being uh, uh, powering, uh, powered by electricity all over the world now. Uh, the, there's a company in Boston called XL Hybrids that is uh, adding electric capability to very large vehicles, trucks and vans and whatnot. So you can look at your whole portfolio of vehicles and you can start getting them electric. Um, a couple reasons to do that is because you want to have meet your city's obligation under the uh, Communities at. You want to lead by example. Um, you really do need to show people uh, for a city uh, who may, everyone's got a car, most families have two, that, that, that these cars work. It's hard to get that point across if you're not going to do that example. So we think it would be a great thing to start showing off some city's electric, uh, some electric cars in, in the fleet. Uh, also, in the resolution is the idea of putting up uh, installing some charging stations. And that's a perfect, uh, perfect. Uh, idea as well. Uh, most charging is done uh, at home, uh, but people, if they're going to come to City Hall for, for our City Council meeting, it would be nice to plug in and be able to, uh, uh, to get some uh, uh, charge in, in, the, uh, in the vehicle for that. It could be uh, a business person coming into the city might want to look for a charging station. Um, you're going to see uh, millennials are um, the least likely folks to buy a car these days, so there's a lot of car sharing and whatnot. Um, more and more in a lot of communities that are growing, we're seeing the ability to um, have uh, electric car sharing as well. So you can have, which you need in order to make that happen, public charging stations. And so you can find different places 
on public property and on private property to make that happen. So there's many, many things that could progressive cities and towns are doing. Uh, some studies have done that have been done to show that when you move a uh, large volume of cars from gasoline to electric, the economy gets better. And so I think you all know the reason is we import all of our gasoline but with electricity we can make it right here in Massachusetts and that improves the balance of payments uh, for the state. And by extension, that would be good for the pocketbook for people in uh, the woods of here. So, lots of good reasons and the resolution. I just think it's a good place to start. And I can answer questions, or David could as well. Thank you. Um, Councilor Council, Fenn. I would like to uh, yield to Councilor DeBone at this point, and again, along with Councilor Yanko, who sponsored the, uh, the resolution. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Finn. And, um, thank you, Madam President. I just want to um, say that I, I'm honored to, to co-sponsor this with Councilor Finn and Councilor Yang on this uh, resolution to look forward to getting less vehicles on the roads. If you talk, talk a little bit about the car sharing, I uh, really like that element of the millennials, car sharing, uh, one vehicle maybe to you know, you know, 10 people. And that would really be great with less vehicles on the road out there. Um, and that, that's a new way of, of of a selling point of our downtown redevelopment. Um, going into the next phase of this is thinking outside the box. How can we get less vehicles on the road and get more green? Um, with all the parks that we're doing in the open space in the city, we're, we're, we're you know, trendsetters. I have to thank the mayor, Mayor Cope, for his vision on this city and what we're doing, transforming and keeping the historical end of it, which is very important for the city but also moving it forward economically. And this is just right down the alley. I want to thank everybody um, from Kukan being up here today. I, I very much enjoyed sitting down with you and learning about all the different things that you guys bring to the table as specialists in the field that you do. Um, I really thank you for all your hard work that you do. Um, with that, if I could, um, if I can, is uh, make a motion to refer this to the Environmental and Public Health um, Committee as being the Vice Chair. All right. Councilman. Okay. Madam President, to if I could add that um, that a copy of this be sent to the mayor. Yes, of course. So referral to uh, what did we say? Uh, environmental and environmental and public health. Environmental and public health. Okay. Council Harris. So this. I make a motion to pass this one. Uh, Certainly, and we'll keep it. It will still stay in it again. It will stay in your committee. Yes. Sure. sure. Go back and ask them there where it back. Okay. All right. So motion by Councillor Finn, seconded by Councillor Ivana on uh, Councillor Niang on the motion. Thank you. I'll be brief. I just wanted to um, take a moment to thank Rick and David and uh, all the members of QK and a lot of them are here tonight that we've met over um, the past year. I've personally been able to uh, sit down with and learn a lot about um, sort of all the new technology that's out there that is allowing us to do what we can just as residents, as business owners um, here and in the city to really make a difference uh, globally, which you know, hopefully will carry on to other cities and towns and then create a bigger impact overall. So you guys are, have been incredibly dedicated and have been, uh, excuse the pun, leading the charge in the city um, to really inform, again, a lot of And try, okay? Yeah, just give you a minute. <laughs> um, you know, it, again, like Councilor Devon said, we're doing a lot in the city to uh, ultimately uh, improve the lives of everyone that lives here and calls this place home. And I think that what you guys are doing is a very important piece to that, to improving the health um, and the lives of folks here in the city. It's important work. Um, it's a lot of uh, work to keep up with because there are all these things coming out every single day. And uh, we have the information from you folks and the tireless efforts that you've made. So I just wanted to thank you for that. Thank you, Councilor. Yeah. Councilor Kawachi, yes. Uh, I just, just briefly, had a thought that I just wanted to throw out there, and I support this. It's, you guys do great work. Um, sometimes I think about what if Council McNamee was still here. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm having one of those moments. <laughs> <laughs> that, uh, that's all that needs to be yep. said. <laughs> <laughs> I think how much fun you would have had. Uh, yeah. uh, 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 thank you, Council Kamuchi, for that brief <laughs> reality. Thank you. All right, so motion's on the table, seconded. Um, May I have a cup of tea with Paul? Councilor King? Yes. Councilor Kroll? Yes. Councilor Bush? Yes. Councilor Finn? Yes. Councilor Harris? Yes. Councilor Lafarge? Yes. 
Council Leigh Ann. Yes. Council Thomas. <coughs> yes. President Hughes. Yes. Nine members. Thank you all. Great. Yes, thank you very much. Thanks for coming in to the uh, Quincy Climate Action Network and to former <coughs> Councilor Creation and also um, uh, Council Pen A copy will be, this will also be referred to the Mayor's Office. So, <coughs> Madam Clerk, that uh, ends our uh, formal agenda for this evening. We will next go to the approval of the previous meeting minutes and those no. are before you, the meeting minutes of April 18th. No, All those in favor? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Great. You guys have it. The waiting minutes are approved. Communications and reports from the mayor, other city officers, and city boards. Um, that occur. Yes, thank you. I have some new craft requests for board referred to ordinance committee for advertising. All of them five. Installed new items in my paper Friday, 7 to 9 a.m. on the lower app, in the section of Furnace Park Highway. Installed new items Monday through Friday, 7 to 9 a.m. on Anderson Road, in the section of Furnace Park Highway. Installed new items in Monday through Friday, 7 to 9 a.m. on Oakland Down, in the section of Furnace Park Highway. Installed new items on Monday through Friday, 3 to 6 p.m. on Willow Ave, in the section of Decoy Ave. Installed do not enter Monday through Friday, 3 to 6 p.m. on Oakland Ave, intersecting with Newport Ave. These will be referred to ordinance committee for advertising. Thank you. All right, refer to ordinance and ask for advertising. I just want to say, as the counselor who uh, represents Ward 5, to those folks who are at home and watching and live in this neighborhood, um, that this is a trial period, that we are trying this. Uh, to alleviate traffic issues and speeding issues in the neighborhood. So um, I know there's a lot of concern on George Road as well. We're going to address that this week. Um, so uh, just sit tight. Please give me your feedback. Let me know. We're going to reevaluate things at the uh, nearer to the end of the summer and trying to decide what we're going to do in that neighborhood. Certainly uh, not a fix all. I want to thank Councillor Kane for uh, joining in in the effort. He represents half of one street in the neighborhood. So um, I want to thank him for uh, his diligence and his patience and uh, for all the residents really in the neighborhood for their patience. It's been difficult. So thank everybody for that. Me included, because I live right at the first do not enter. So. Um, all right. With that, uh, we will go to unfinished business in the preceding meeting. Anyone? Anyone? No. Reports of committees. Presentation of petitions, memorials, or remonstrance. Anyone? Anyone? All right. At this time, I would like to. Oh, okay. It's, it's right after you. So. Um, with. Um, with sadness, we, we lost a couple of uh, local legends uh, this past week, including John Gillis, but one of our, uh, in Ward 3, one of our neighbors from Wallace and Montclair areas, Janet Crowley, who's the wife of Howie Crowley. Um, Janet and Howie, you know, you know, were in and institutions to the neighborhood. Uh, they're co-founders of the Montclair Wallace Neighborhood Association, very active in Sacred Heart Parish. Um, how we remains active in Knights of Columbus, other organizations. Uh, Janet was a longtime board member from Ward 3 uh, for QCAP. Um, we put a lot of effort into, into, into that area also. She was part of the North Quincy Catholic Women's Club. Um, she was adored by her husband, um, I attended the wake today, and, and how he was a great guy. Um, you know, he was noticed we choked up, and you know, we as a community uh, for sure would be there for him. Um, you know, there were children, his grandchildren were there. Uh, very civic minded. She was part of the Montclair Code Club, girls softball and bowling, Montclair School PTA, past president of the Paw Academy Mothers Guild. Um, I mean, she did it all. She was she was one of these people, like uh, John Gillis, who you know you would have to live a lifetime in order to do even half of what they accomplished. So, um, on behalf of the city council, just want to send our, our love and, and prayers to the Crowley family. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor King. Councilor Penn. Uh, yeah, Mr. Madam President, with the consent of the body, I would like to raise a matter of uh, personal privilege. And um, the timing for this is really not the greatest, but it's actually unavoidable. Um, and what I mean by that is on an evening when we uh, um, 
on the person with the likes of John Gillis, but you know, there's really no good time for this. Um, and yet after much, much thought and reflection about this, uh, I thought the best way of dealing with this is we know nomination papers are coming out tomorrow. And I thought the best way to share this would be directly with my colleagues. So I'm announcing this evening that I will not seek nomination or re-election as a Quincy Councilor at large in the November 2017 election. And I'm not seeking re-election both for personal and professional reasons. And as much as I believe in that old adage, never say never, and I do not exclude the possibility of running for public office at some future point, uh, this evening I'm not excluding myself from re-election either for that reason, nor to assume any other office. It will be 16 years that I've served uh, as a Quincy City Councilor at large. I can think of no greater privilege or honor than it has been to serve in this position. My life has been influenced by the wonderful, generous, committed men and women I have had the honor to serve with. And my respect for all those who hold public office has, has grown immensely over this time. I've had the honor to serve with two mayors for whom Despite their doubts at times, uh, I had tremendous respect for it. I thank them both for what they've taught me about courage and commitment. My colleagues over the years on the City Council have made the deepest impression on me. To have the courage, the spirit of sacrifice, and the willingness week after week to be a decision maker committed to the people of this wonderful city takes far more than, than most will ever know. As I've said in the past, it's a great challenge to surrender the luxury of opinion for the reality of deciding. I thank all of you here for your service and commitment. I'd like to thank the auditor, the clerk, and the clerk of the committees, and all the staff that make our jobs much easier and say what an honor it has been to work with you. I hope, uh, though, that I can learn to operate the ta tablet before December ends. <laughs> I want most of all to thank all of those people who serve the city of Quincy that I've had the honor to work with. These are the folks that get up every day, go to work without notoriety or status, and keep the city move, moving from department heads to public safety to our incredible school personnel to DPW Park and, and DPW and Park laborers to the clerks to all those who had to deal with my often annoying phone calls. Uh, thank you. I know it's popular today to deride public service, but I can say firsthand you are an honor to the city and worthy of great praise. Finally, it goes without saying that my gratitude is with the many voters in Quincy who have voted and given me this great honor, and I hope I have lived up to your trust. And obviously, as well, I thank my wife and my family. My wife claims I never asked permission to run for office, but, but I did to leave. Um, when I first sought office in 1999, I did so with the conviction that new voices had to be heard. When I first won office in 2001, I never intended to stay as long as I did. It seems fitting at this point to know that I'm returning to that fundamental principle that led me to pursue election. Our electoral process is the way for new voices to be heard, and I encourage anyone who feels called to seek public office to go for it. As Jim Sheets used to say, if you have that fire in your belly, you know, go for it. I honestly can say at this point, I can think of no greater, no nobler calling or service to your community to both seek election and serve the great people of Quincy. And I do want to note, as always, uh, very important person in my life who made it, who actually made it possible for me to be in this office through his hard work. And he's here in the gallery this evening, as supportive as he's always been. And that's Michael Ferry. And, uh, Michael, thank you. And I think you and I both are going to have to come, come up with a new way to lose weight. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But finally, let me say I'm committed to serving out what remains of my term with great vigor. I will continue to uphold the sworn responsibility of this office for as long as I serve. And thank you all very much.
Yeah. <laughs> thank you all. Seriously, thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Finn, and uh, we will obviously miss you. And I want to commend you. It must have been difficult to do. I know nomination papers are coming out tomorrow, but it must have been a difficult thing for you to do today, particularly with uh, the passing of, um, of John Gillis and just thinking about all that and, um, and then coming in and talking about it in our way. And I know what an unassuming person you are. So um, we obviously wish you luck and, and you know, happiness. You. you will be happy without Monday nights to, uh, <laughs> to, to tear you down. But um, at any rate. Yes, yes, you will. Yes, yes of course. Uh, all right. Well, thank you very much. Uh, motions, orders, and resolutions? Okay. Scheduling of committee meetings and public hearings. Council Kroll. Last budget, job. <laughs> yeah, Tia Zorin is Alex, yeah. All right, folks, um, through sort of expression of the body in, in various capacities, I'm um, going to share dates for the budget hearing, uh, beginning with next Monday at 6.30 p.m., that would be May 8th. We'll have a public hearing on the budget. And we'll hear from um, Jim Powers, the city's outside auditor, external auditor. And then we'll go into our first session where we deliberate the budget that was proposed <coughs> to us here this evening. Um, a little bit different of an approach, and I know folks had um, you know, kind of conflicting schedules. Uh, so May 12th, that's a Friday. Will be in the chamber at for an 8:30 a.m. budget hearing, and um, you'll get all of these. And, and I'm asking Mr. Walker, who's been great to work with uh, so far, um, you know, to get us an agenda for May 8th by Wednesday. I think that's fairly reasonable. Thursday, yeah, Wednesday, Thursday, the latest. We can get that out to the group. And then, um, you know, subsequently, we'll, we'll build out the agenda for Friday, the 12th. But um, it seems as if that worked best for most folks, again, given the schedule. And um, I think it'll be nice to come in here with a uh, you know, fresh mind, first thing in the morning, and, and go through the budget. And for the folks uh, listening or watching at home, that is, um, you know, that these meetings are open as well. Uh, the public hearing for May 8th and May 12th, the 8th, 30th day of kickoff. Uh, Madam President, May 15th, I believe, is the next council meeting. So we're working just a little um, a little time in the beginning to be obviously ending your discretion, but um, start the meeting at maybe 725, open up the finance committee meetings, we can continue to work through, talk through park improvement plan, go into the regular scheduled city council meeting, and then um, potentially you know, move forward with the uh, park improvement plan later in that, uh, in that meeting. So that's the, that would be the 15th. Um, knowing that, you know, we had a couple of dates already scheduled, and that, again, we're going to be running pretty hot here. Uh, I kind of struck, struck down the uh, 17th, was already kind of earmarked for a meeting, so we will not meet on the 17th of the Finance Committee. Um, I would just say put a placeholder in. It's already scheduled, but for the 24th of the Finance Committee meeting. So they probably already have that in the calendar, but just leave that standing to strike the 17th. So uh, the 8th, the 12th, the 15th, and the 24th. Look forward to seeing you all. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you. Anyone else? If I could, is there anybody else that wants to schedule? No. Okay. I just wanted to try to fit this in on uh, education 2017-40, which is the uh, resolve. It's called substance. Actually, it's called the use hearings. They, they changed the word from abuse to use now. So it's not really a, it's just a term. That, uh, but I was looking to possibly, I know we're going into budget season. I know we're, um, we've got a lot of other things going on with CIP and uh, the park. But I really want to fit this one meeting in before we get to this to the session. So if I could, um, let me know uh, June 5th, 
6.30 before the other meeting. Does that look like something for, I think that works? Yeah. 6.30. No. Education. Uh, education at the uh, substance use hearings, basically. We, we, we canceled it last time yeah. just to try to fit it in. I think it's important. Good. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? All right. At this time, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Aye.